you're about to take a full IELTS listening test. Now, I know that sounds quite hard, but I promise you at the end of this video, you're gonna feel really good because you'll feel ready and prepared for your own IELTS test. Just in case you don't know, this is the scoring for the IELTS listening test. As you can see from this scoring criteria, you can't make many mistakes if you wanna get a good score on this test. So that's why practicing is so important. And that's why I made this video for you today. Now, there are two things you need to know before you start this listening test. Number one is that the answers for each question will come at the end of the section. As you know, on the IELTS test, there are four sections. So I show you the answers at the end of each section. The second main difference is to do with the time limit. The time limits in this video are not exactly the same as on the IELTS test. So if you need more time, just pause the video. And that's it. I'm sure this video is gonna be really helpful for you. If you think it is, write yes below in the comments and I'll make more videos like this. That's enough from me. Good luck and I'll see you at the end of the video. Part one. You will hear a man who runs a recruitment agency talking to a young woman looking for a job. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now, we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, Edwina, is it? Uh, have a seat. Oh, yes, Edwina. Thanks. I'm looking for a job as a nanny. I like working with children. I talked to you yesterday. Oh, yes. Well, uh, we covered most of the ground on the phone yesterday. I've got a form I need to complete for my records. So, you're Edwina Riley, and how should we contact you? Oh, by email. I check it regularly. What's the address? It's Edwina, like my name, then R-I, the first two letters of my surname, at worldnit.com. E-D-W-I-N-A-R-I at worldnet.com? Yes. Good. And you're from Australia? Actually, I'm a New Zealander. Oh, I'm sorry. I bet it's really irritating being told you're an Australian. Like Canadians being asked what part of the States they're from. I'm used to it. It happens to us all the time. Uh, and now, you said on the phone that you could bring me some references. Uh, one from someone who's known you in a professional capacity and one personal one. Oh, yeah. Uh, here's one from John Keane, who was the manager at the Play Centre in Wellington, where I worked for three years after I left school. It's got all his contact details on. Thank you. So, this was your last employer? Yes, apart from a bit of waitressing recently, but that was just temporary. I'm sure John will answer any questions if you contact him. Uh, we do run checks, yes. And a personal reference? Oh, you can contact the friend of my mother's I'm staying with here in London, Eileen Dorsini. She's a professor. She's known me all my life because she used to be our neighbour back home when she was a primary school teacher there. Now she's working here at the Institute of Education. Oh, good. I've got her contact details here for you. Hey, thanks. Uh, I think I have some jobs to suit you. Oh, do you have any practical qualifications, by the way? Uh, Life-saving, uh, music, anything? Um, well, I've got an up-to-date first aid certificate. I did a course when I was working. That's good. First aid. Anything else? Well, I've got a driving licence, as I told you on the phone, but that's not special, you said. Almost everyone needs that, really. I've got a sailing qualification. It's a certificate of competence. So you're a yachtswoman? I love sailing. Well, I'll note you have a certificate. 
Hmm. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Now, as I mentioned yesterday, there are three families and the job description is much the same for all of them, as I explained. There are a few other things you need to know. Anyway, the first family is here in London. Yes, I did make a few notes. London, uh, that's the Bentons with two children? Yes, that's right. A girl of three and her brother, who's eight. The little boy has a quite serious food allergy. Did you learn about things like that on your course? Oh, well, I know what to do if someone has an allergic reaction. Good. But what they mainly want is someone with an interest in sport, as well, that's the kind of family they are. Oh, that's OK. I'll enjoy that. Good. Now, the next people are in the country near Oxford. Oh, yeah. The Grangers? Yeah, so they have twin boys of five, who are a bit of a handful, I suspect. <laughs> but uh, it's a lovely place, quite a grand house, and the family is extremely welcoming. They keep horses. Do you ride? I did when I was younger. I like animals generally. Well, Animal Lover was their special request, so you'd be fine there. Uh, the last family... Yes? I don't think I told you. They live in Scotland. Really? What's their name? Campbell. Oh, yes. And they have four girls under ten? That's it. They have a lovely city flat and they own a small island. Wow! Actually, you might get on with them very well. They particularly wanted someone who would be prepared to cook when they go camping on the island. Camping would really suit me, and I'm used to taking my turn doing the food, but it is a long way from London. Hmm. Yeah, well, you can think about it. Um, then, as soon as I've checked your references, we can arrange for you to talk to all of the families. Right. Thanks very much. Thank you. I'll email you as soon as I can. Part 2. You will hear a woman talking to a group of people who are looking round a sports and leisure centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 14. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I'm very pleased to be able to welcome you to CityScope, our lovely modern sports and leisure facility. I've brought you up to the rooftop cafe on top of the stadium so that you can enjoy the view while I explain briefly what we have here and point out to you the major features of the site. Then we'll go round and have a look at ground level. Oh, that'd be interesting. I'm glad. We're extremely proud of this new facility. You see, when the project was first discussed, we expected that a multinational company would give us half our funding and the central government grant would make up most of the rest, with a smaller contribution from local business. Well, we'd got quite far into the planning stage when the multinational pulled out and both central and local government decided they couldn't afford anything. So, we ended up with a beautiful project, a small amount of sponsorship promised by local organisations, and nothing else. <laughs> 
We thought we'd never build it. But at the last moment, we had an amazing donation of several million pounds from a national transport company. And that got us going again. And we managed to get all the rest from local fundraising. There's hardly a street in the city that hasn't made its contribution one way or another. So there's a true sense of local ownership here. So this is what we got. We wanted a new stadium because the 1950s football stadium is on the other side of town and is shortly due to be pulled down and built over. This site was the old airport with some playing fields on one side of it and a few buildings from the 1930s when the airfield first opened. So we were able to plan a new stadium with plenty of room for all the things people wanted. The playing fields have been upgraded and refenced, so they are now a set of top quality outdoor pitches for amateur football, hockey and so on. We have both sports and other entertainments here. We want to encourage all kinds of people onto the site and hope some of them may come to use the cinema or the cafe and end up trying the fitness centre. These are all grouped together. The cafe is in the original 1930s passenger hall and the architects have managed to retain some of the elegant style of the building. The other buildings, like the control tower, which would have made a great feature, and the aircraft hangars, which we had hoped might house the fitness centre, were unfortunately not structurally sound enough to preserve. So, everything else is newly built, opened in 2010. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Right, now if you'd like to gather a little closer to the window, I'll point out the various buildings. <laughs> We're at the highest point of the stadium here in the rooftop cafe, on the opposite side to the main entrance doors. On our left, you can see two buildings just beyond the end of the stadium. The closest one is the business centre, used for meetings and conferences and so on, which provides a good source of revenue for the upkeep of the sports facilities. And next to the business centre, the bigger building is the hotel, which is rented from us by an independent company. As you see, they are served by the perimeter road, which runs round three quarters of the site. Now, coming round to the front of the building, immediately in front of the entrance, that circular open space at the end of the road is the transport hub. From here, there are buses and a monorail link to the free car park, about 10 minutes from here, but you can't see that. There's also a large secure cycle park, Oh, and disabled parking, of course. People find it's very convenient and it keeps the site virtually car-free. OK, now if you look as far as you can over to the right, beyond the buildings, you can see our outdoor pitches, which I mentioned earlier. Between the pitches and the entrance is a little kind of pedestrian plaza. Are you with me? OK, with the cinema in the building furthest away from us, next to the pitches. Then there's the ten-pin bowling between the cinema and the road. Near the far end of the perimeter road and between the mini roundabout and the pitches, there's our fitness centre with all kinds of equipment and a small pool and changing rooms for teams using the pitches. 
Then, joined onto the stadium, next to the entrance, is a range of small shops, which all specialise in sports equipment, clothes, shoes. They sell toys and so on as well. All that sort of thing. They seem to be doing well. As you see, the service road goes right round, but we keep the traffic and the pedestrians well apart. So it's all very relaxed round the plaza, popular with families. And just in front of the bowling is our lovely restaurant. You can see it from here. It's that building on the plaza between us and the bowling. It's open all day and in the evenings. There's quite a queue there at weekends, I'm pleased to say. So, now you've got the layout, we can go and have a closer look at everything. Oh, oh, nice. Part 3. You will hear two people called Chloe and Ivan talking about a business studies course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Oh, hi, Ivan. Oh, hi, Chloe. I'm glad I bumped into you because I've been looking at this prospectus about courses at the university. I'm thinking of doing a business studies degree. Isn't that what you're doing? Yes, I'm about to start my third year. I think you'd enjoy it. Is there something on the course that you're not sure about? Well, you know I've been working for a publisher for the last four years as a production assistant. That will be really valuable experience, because a lot of people go to university straight from school and don't have that kind of background. Yeah, I know. And I'm used to dealing with figures and percentages and things, but it's been a while since I've sat down and put my ideas into an essay. I was never that good at it, and I'm not sure I can do it now. But you did OK at school, hmm. so I'm sure you'll soon get into it again. I was worried about different things when I started, like if I'd be able to use all the computer programmes. But you only really need the basics. You have to do a lot of presentations, and I thought that would be hard. But we'd actually had such a lot of practice at school, it was fine. But did you find writing essays easy? Oh, it was OK. But I was hopeless at getting them in by the deadline. <laughs> and I was always late for lectures, so I had to work hard at that. And I tend to be early now. It's good that you've sorted yourself out before <laughs> you go and get a job, or you might not have it very long. <laughs> <laughs> I think the course looks really interesting. It is. And it also gave me the chance to spend six months working in a local business last year. <laughs> That's not so important for me. Unless I could go abroad to use my foreign languages. But that doesn't seem to be on offer, which mm. is a shame. What really appeals to me, though, is the idea of being assessed throughout the year. I think that's a much more productive way of learning, instead of everything being decided in an exam at the end. It's good for people like you who are hard-working all year round. You'll be spending all your time in the library. They've just expanded it too. Mm, that's good. Well, yes and no. They've made the study area bigger, but it means they've taken some of the magazines and periodicals away. Mm. So I think it was better as it was. The university is expanding all the time, and there are lots of new courses coming next year. Well, that's great news, isn't it? It means the college will have a better reputation, as more people will hear about it. So... That's good for us. Hmm, I agree, but they really need to add more lecture rooms, as we often have lectures in tiny rooms. Well, you obviously think overall it's a good place to do a degree. I should probably go and have a look round. Well, it's holidays now, and there's not much going on there. Oh, so it's probably not worth going in now? 
but you could email my tutor. I know he'd be happy to answer any questions. I can give you his email address. <laughs> I looked at quite a lot of other universities and read loads of prospectuses, but I thought this one was the best. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. I was a bit unsure about all the different subjects you can choose on this course. Well, I can tell you a bit about them. There are some subjects you have to do and some that you can choose. Mm -hmm. The most interesting course I've done is public relations. From what I've read, it doesn't look very demanding. Some of it is really just common sense. <laughs> but it will be really useful if you want to go into marketing or advertising. That's true. But I need to find out a bit more about it first before I decide mm. if it will really help me. It's difficult to tell from the prospectus. But you are interested in marketing. Oh, yes. Well, you can choose a marketing course. I wasn't very impressed with that course, actually. The tutor didn't make it very interesting. <laughs> it's good to put on your CV that you've done a marketing course, though. So that would be a definite for me, and maybe I'd get a different tutor. Hmm. What other courses did you choose? I'm doing taxation as I was thinking of training to be an accountant, but I'm not sure now. Oh, that will be a good option for me, because I enjoy working with figures. Although I don't want to be an accountant, it'll be good to have an understanding of taxation, especially if I ever run my own business. Then there's the most popular course, which is human resources, and a lot of people seem to get jobs in that field. Mm, my friend works in human resources, and she's really good at it. But I don't think I've got the right personality, so I'd give that one a miss. <laughs> I'm more interested in how businesses actually work, the structure. That's a compulsory course, the structure of business. Oh. But you might find information systems helpful. Is that kind of computer programs? Some of it is, but also databases, project management and other things. Oh, this sounds useful. But I'll have to look at some of the other possibilities first. Mm. You know, Ivan, this course sounds as though it would suit me. I'm going to apply. <laughs> Great. If there's anything else you want to ask me, you've got my number. <laughs> Thanks. Part 4 you will hear a geography student giving a presentation about sand to fellow students. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. First, I would like to tell you how the Argus computerised photography system has helped marine researchers. Then I shall talk a bit about sand collecting. Well, Argus is the system Dr Rob Holman developed when he was working at a research pier on the coast of North Carolina about 20 years ago. This pier stretches out over the water and it's the longest research pier in the world, with an observation tower on the end of it. The researchers there make precise measurements of how the sand moves about under the waves. This research is critical to the study of beach erosion, in places where the coastline is being worn away. The Argus system helps to solve the difficulties encountered by these researchers, the system correlates the data from under the water with what Dr Holman gets from his fixed camera, which is mounted above the water on the pier and uses time-lapse photography. Some of Dr Holman's results have changed the way people understand how sand moves. To quote S. Jeffries Williams, 
a coastal geologist with the United States Geological Survey, the system is a critical piece of new technology. And the Argus system allows us to quantify and document visually the changes to the coast on a variety of different time frames. A lot of these take place when there is a storm or at other times when it is difficult to have people out on the beach making observations and taking measurements. Up to now, Argus installations have been installed in places in Oregon, California, Hawaii, England, the Netherlands, Australia, New Zealand, Spain, Italy and Brazil, as well as in North Carolina. Now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Holman's sand collection. He started collecting sand in the 1980s, and he still collects it now, even though he has around a thousand samples. They come from his travels, and from geologists and amateurs all over the world, and the collection includes sand from each continent, including Antarctica. People send him sand in envelopes, plastic bags, paper towels and all sorts. Each is stored in a glass jar, which Dr. Holman labels by latitude and longitude of its origin, as well as he can work them out. Sometimes the information is a bit sketchy. Anyway, it's mainly geology students at the university who study his collection, and they can learn a lot from it. For instance, one set of tubes display sand from the east coast of the US, so you can see that the sand gets lighter and finer from north to south. By the time a grain of sand eventually washes up on a beach in Florida, at the southern end of that journey, it has been battered by waves for a long time, so the grains are fine and rounded, because most of the time sand is not stationary on the beach. OK, so if you'd like to collect sand and maybe even send some to Dr. Holman, how should you go about it? Well, the list of equipment is very short and easy to find, but you should keep a supply when you're travelling, as you never know when you'll come across an interesting sand sample. One really handy thing for digging sand, especially if it's hard or frozen, is a spoon. It's perfect for that. If you're travelling by air, it'll have to be plastic, but metal is preferable, as plastic tends to break. You need something to put the samples in that is damp-proof and easy to carry. You can just use plastic bags, but you need to record the location and date on the bag, so you must also have a permanent marker with you, because you can never assume you will remember where you gathered a sample from later on, and you don't want it to rub off before you get home. And that's about all you need in the field to collect sand. When you get home, your samples should be logged in a notebook or computer. You need to note the location and be really specific as to exactly whereabouts on the beach you gathered your sample. Low tide mark, under cliff area, etc. Then you store your sample. You want to keep everything in good condition and avoid contamination. So, first you make absolutely sure that each sample is perfectly dry. You don't need any complicated apparatus for this. You can just air it out on layers of newspaper, which is suitably absorbent. Most people find that's the best way. Then, lastly, but this is really important, before there can be any chance of confusing this latest sample with another, you put it in a clean small bag or a jar and you must stick an identification label on straight away. Some people put one inside as well, in case the outer label falls off, but that's up to you. Well, that's about all you need to know to get started as a sand collector. Any questions? That is the end of part four. 
Okay guys, you just finished a full IELTS test. If you thought that was helpful, write yes below in the comments. That will show to me that you like this type of video and I'll make more. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.